Good evening. Six th it's uh, 632, the meeting will come to order. I wanna welcome you to the Pasco School Board meeting this evening. Thank you for attending and for your interest in Pasco Public Schools. Understand that while it may appear that the board is moving quickly on important decisions, there have been previous opportunities for discussions on all of these issues, either in earlier meetings, study sessions, or in board workshops, which are open public meetings. Earlier uh, this afternoon at 4.30, when our normally held study session occurs, we discussed bond options for a bond in February of 2017. Our next uh, study session will be on the second Tuesday of May, and we will continue that discussion looking at um, some of our top options we're going to get a little bit more detail from the district on those options and and discuss that further so if you're interested in that please attend as directors we each strive to understand all the issues brought before us and to make decisions that we believe are in the best interest of all students of Pasco School District and the taxpayers who provide the funding to make study sessions and board meeting proceedings available to those who are not able to attend, these events are recorded for broadcast on PSC TV channel 191 on Charter Cable, and they are also broadcast on the school district's YouTube. And then finally, we're fortunate to have three board student board representatives sitting to my left. They've been serving since uh, last July. And um, they can't make, <clears throat> they can't vote or make decisions, but they're an uh, important part of our decision-making process on a as a board, and they help give us perspective of students. And we would uh, encourage all 11th and 12th graders to fill out an application to be on the student student representatives for our board for next year. Those applications are on the school district website, and they're due on May 6th. So uh, next, we'll have the flag salute. And we have Steve Stevens Middle School Principal Charlotte Stingley. Good evening, School Board President Lehrman, Deputy Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board. This evening, I'm honored to have Ariel and Flounder from the cast of The Little Mermaid to present the flag salute. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Stingley, did you want to introduce the students by their by their uh, given names? <laughs> I do actually. They they prepared to introduce themselves oh, okay. and their family members. Sounds good. So, <laughs> so what what event are they? What, tell us about your play or school. The production is next weekend. It's at Chiwana High School. It's The Little Mermaid, and it's Friday and Saturday night at 7 p.m., and tickets are on sale at Stevens Middle School currently, or you can purchase them at the door. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves and their family. Hi, my name is Emmy Friday, and with me I have my sister, Brisa Friday. My name's Osmar Villa, and with me I have my mom, Josefina Freire. The play is on May 6th and 7th at Chihuahua High School Theater at 7 p.m. Hope to see you there. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we'll have Ms. Smith call the roll. Mr. Christensen? Present. Dr. Richardson? Present. Ms. Lankin? Present. Mr. Bergstrom? Present. Mr. Lehrman? Present. Mr. Mendoza? Present. Mrs. Phillips? Present. Mr. Present. All right, we have special recognition for Ms. Le with Ms. Leslie Call. 
Thank you. Good evening, um, President Lehrman, Deputy Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board. <clears throat> May 2nd through 6th is Teacher Appreciation Week, and May 3rd is National Teacher Day. Activities and celebrations will be going on throughout the district to honor PASCO teachers. Tonight, we'd like to honor teachers who've earned their national board certification this school year. This advanced teaching credential is achieved upon successful complete completion of a voluntary assessment program designed to recognize effective and accomplished teachers who meet high standards based on on what teachers should know and be able to do. As part of the certification process, candidates complete 10 assessments that are reviewed by trained teachers in their certificate areas. The assessments include four port portfolio entries that feature teaching practice and six constructed response exercises that assess content knowledge. This year, nine more PASCO teachers earned this prestigious certification. PASCO currently has 97 National Board Certified Teachers. When I call your name, please come forward and remain up front for a group photo. And we have a plaque for you to hang in your classroom to celebrate and acknowledge this great accomplishment. And I'm just going to read everyone's names and we'll hope most of them are here. Um, our newest National Board Certified Teachers are Crystal DeBuen, Eriberto Frijas, uh, Crystal's at Chiawana High School and Eriberto is at uh, Curie STEM Elementary, Nicholas Meha, Livingston Elementary, Colt Nickel, Stevens Middle School, Brooke Robert, Chiawana High School, Angela Rose, Angelo Elementary, Jeff Spar, Ochoa Middle School, Jennifer Spar, Stevens Middle School. I wonder how you guys spent your evenings. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Julie Stadelman, uh, Chiwana High School. So congratulations to these teachers who have gone to an extra mile to gain national certification. And thank you to all of our PASCO teachers. Please take the opportunity next week to thank a teacher who has made a difference in the life of a child, especially if that child was you. Congratulations to all the teachers that got their uh, National Board Certificate. And we will recess for 10 minutes to celebrate this occasion. We'll start back up at uh, 6.50. All right. So next we have the approval of meeting minutes. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the meeting uh, minutes of April uh, 12, 2016. <laughs> Second. <clears throat> There's a motion and a second to approve the regular meeting minutes from April 12, 2016. Those in favor, please say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, agenda review, please. We will be requesting an executive session this evening under 4230110 b real estate. We're <coughs> estimating it'll take about 20 minutes. And Randy Nunnemaker will be joining us this evening. All right, and we'll move on to audience comments. In just a moment, I'll invite up audience members for comments. All comments and any questions will be noted. If you ask a question and would like additional response, please ensure that you leave your contact information in the back. Uh, we'll use this contact information to respond or have district staff respond to questions. If you would like to comment or have questions on a board report topic tonight, which is, uh, or reports or discussion in section nine up there, we have a nutrition services update and a board legislative proposal. Uh, we would ask that you make those comments after the board has had that report and discussion with district staff is complete. So now if you have a comment, please approach the microphone and state your name and your affiliation with the school district. You'll have two mi minutes and Ms. Cloud will be keeping time when she holds up the yellow folder, it means you have 30 more seconds, and the red folder signals that your time is up. All right, if we have no audience comments, we'll move on to communications, and we'll start with Dr. Richardson. 
So uh, in the last couple of weeks, I visited Curie and McClintock STEM elementary schools and uh, appreciate Ms. Aragon and, and Mr. Morales for allowing me to visit their schools and met with teachers and staff at those schools, uh, which are two new schools this year, two elementary schools. Um, I went to CHESS to their art and science night. Uh, uh, thanks to the invitation of one of the students, Leilani, and appreciated her uh, giving me uh, a tour and uh, showing me what they'd been doing. It was uh, great to see their accomplishments. Uh, we had our Spanish community forum last week and appreciate all those that came and provided input, which is invaluable to us. Uh, and finally, I attended the Pasco and Chihuahua boys soccer game, which went into overtime. Uh, Chihuahua won in overtime. Uh, it was extremely exciting and was a packed house there. Uh, and on that note, um, Ms. Stadelman, who received her National Board Certification recognition tonight, I picked out her husband from the crowd. He was a coach of mine when I was a kid, and just was great to visit with him now and thank him. And, you know, as teachers and coaches, you just really have a lasting impact on people. And uh, after 20 years, I immediately picked him out of the crowd and uh, just appreciate all you do for the youth in our community. Thanks. Stephen and I were, um, went to a, a small board conference in, in um, College Place, and that was really interesting. We learned a lot of things. We were able to tour that brand new school and see some of the innovative things that they're doing there, as well as um, get updated on the legislative, thing, the le legislative things that, have, that pertain to um, our district, as well as seeing some, some tools that really help um, communication that that we're really going in that direction trying to to help um, our communication be better between the the community and and the district so that was that was really great um, did want to congratulate um, our full four schools that had kids go to the chess tournament in the elementary school they did very well and that was really exciting so I'll pass. Um, I was able to attend um, this past Tuesday to a purple and gold event at the University of Washington where I met some UW students and they advised me of what the do's and don'ts at college and they also told me that like a loophole, loophole on like making sure you get the classes you want. And I also, at the end of the event, I was able to sign my acceptance letter personally and also Prom, May 14th, seniors. <laughs> um, yeah, and then graduation is also coming up. And then after a month of having to take, um, of not having, um, not being allowed to run, I ran my first track meet this past Saturday. Didn't go as good, but it, I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, good, e good evening, everybody. Um, this past weekend, I was able to participate in Launch Weekend, an, uh, an entrepreneurial workshop hosted by Fuse and JMK Tech at WSU, uh, where I officially introduced Other Side Groceries, the company that I am founding with my <coughs> business partner. <coughs> As well, uh, two days ago, I was notified that I was a recipient of the HAP scholarship, so I'm really you know, happy about that. You know, free money for college. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. A um, couple quick announcements about Pasco High School. Um, we have a play coming up. Ms. Nelson is missing. Um, it was actually last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at our, at our auditorium, but it's actually this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as well. Um, we have prom May 14th. Everyone's super excited about that. Uh, it'll be at the Moore Mansion off campus for the, uh, the first time in a long while, so everyone's really excited about that. Uh, we had the NHS uh, National Honor Society induction um, last night, and we had two really great speakers, Mr. Mendoza, who's uh, my calculus teacher at, at um, Pasco High, and Deputy Superintendent Whitney, who um, they both did a fantastic job and really inspired our, our new um, inductees. Uh, we have AP tests next week. Um, that'll be interesting to see how those go. <laughs> Uh, I also attended a community conversation, and um, it was all in Spanish, so I got to test my Spanish-speaking abilities. So that class hopefully is paying off a little bit. Um, I'm also honored to be selected as a Rotary Scholar um, 
this past over the I think it was like last week or so. So that was awesome. Um, I really I really uh, am thankful for their support and um, believing in me uh, for college and everything. So yeah, thank you. <coughs> A couple weeks ago, attended the WASDA regional meeting with Ms. Phillips. It was uh, pretty instructive, and I think the, the most interesting part, honestly, was the presentation on the communication software. It looked very interesting. It's a fairly new company out of uh, Georgia, somewhere down south there. And <clears throat> the lady did a, a presentation over the internet I guess whatever you call it was uh, she was in Georgia and we were here um, attended the Pasco invite got to be a security guy at the gate there between the two uh, triple jump pits and saw some of the top jumpers in the state performing there that was kind of interesting to fun to visit with them Ross Hunter came to visit Pasco uh, was able to spend some time with him I that was the first time I'd been to the Lakeview Aulis um, classroom there, and there was four students from Chiawana that were participating, that had participated in that, and did a great job. I think Mr. Hunter's um, vision was expanded on, on some of the challenges that we face here, and so I think it was a very worthwhile effort. I want to thank the district for putting that together and hosting that. We visited. Uh, other sites as well, Curie, Chess, and Robinson, and want to thank them. <clears throat> like uh, Dr. Richardson, I attended the Chess Science and Arts Showcase, <coughs> had an escort to take me around and see some of the projects they're working on, uh, and then the Community Forum at Robinson, and also uh, was able to visit the IPAL lab in uh, at McLaughlin with Mr. Levitt and the two teachers there whose names I don't remember. I'm not, I'm not good at that. But uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm excited about the prospects and possibilities that that will offer our community. I think uh, I wish they had that so many years ago when I was in school. I think that would have been a wonderful thing to participate in. So thank you. Uh, I <clears throat> I was able to go with uh, Mr. Christensen and district staff on the tour with Ross Hunter. He's the uh, director of early learning. He was recently appointed, maybe three or four months ago, by the governor and um, Mr. Christensen, we, myself. We had talked to him this past year as we went over. He was a, a past legislator, uh, state legislator, and so he he knew our story and wanted to come see it for himself. And I was I, I was able to go to uh, Chess and and Curie and Robinson. I did I missed the um, Lakeview portion of the tour but from what I understand he was very impressed and was going to try and work with district staff to to get either some buildings over there or use their existing clubhouse and try and help us get state operating money to put a pre-k center there so excited to work with him the district and, and our district staff to see if we can make that happen um, also attended the Pasco invite with my children had a great time as always doing that and we had our community forum that several um, of our members alluded to here over at Stevens it was our first forum um, as Carson said in span uh, Robinson sorry at uh, Robinson uh, our first forum in Spanish and it was for the Hispanic parents and community to to share their concerns and and uh, questions with us and I think that was great so we look forward to continuing uh, communication with all of Pasco you know through these community forums um, to have more two-way dialogue that we're not always able to have here at the board meetings I would like to acknowledge um, Tim Sullivan who is the district level administrator that helps support athletics and the Pasco Infight is truly a community event that if you have never been even if you're not a track and field person I would highly recommend that you go and experience what is a well-organized high quality event that showcases just phenomenal talent of our youth and I wanted to recognize Mr. Sullivan as well as the ADs for both Chiwana and Pasco High School um, who organize and put that on there may there must have been a hundred hundred and fifty volunteers that really make that a community effort in support of what are very, very impressive youth. So, Mr. Sullivan, thank you, and please pass on the thanks to both of our high school athletic programs as well. 
the other thing that I wanted to acknowledge was the um, NFL um, Super Bowl um, gold football that was presented, the two of them that were presented to uh, Pasco uh, High School for the football players. Um, that's an awesome um, thing that Pasco High School was recognized for having two NFL uh, players that had um, played in the, in the Super Bowl. So that's a pretty exciting thing for the city of Pasco. Next, we'll move on to reports and discussion. I would like to invite uh, Kristen Blair to the podium. Um, she's here tonight to provide the board with information from the Nutrition, Service, Nutrition Services Department um, and recommendations around our community eligibility program and also some information regarding school lunch prices. Okay, thank you. Board President Lerman, Deputy Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board, thank you for the invitation to present. So tonight's presentation, uh, tonight's presentation topics are paid lunch equity and then community eligibility provision. With each topic, recommendations will be presented and those recommendations will also be brought back to you for action at the next board meeting. Okay, so we'll begin with the paid lunch equity. The United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, sets minimum average lunch prices for the following year. The minimum average price is the difference between the federal paid, or excuse me, the federal free reimbursement rate and the paid reimbursement rate. So this year, the free reimbursement is $3.09. The paid reimbursement is $0.31, cents, which is a difference of $2.78. That is the minimum average price for next school year. The process to determine the district's compliance with this minimum average pricing is called the paid lunch equity. And the paid lunch equity, it only deals with paid rates. It does not have anything to do with free or reduced statistics or regulations. Okay. A district determines what their weighted average lunch price is by their total lunches that are paid that are served in October. So for PASCO, we have um, two lunch prices. We have elementary price at $2.60. We have the secondary at $2.85. The paid lunch e equity is a weighted calculation. So what that means for us is 64% of those October lunches were at the elementary price, 36% were at the secondary price. So what our uh, average weighted price in October was $2.68, which is below what the USDA has set for the average price for next year. N compliance with the USDA's uh, paid lunch equity is required, but how we get to the average minimum pricing, that is a local decision. Now contributing to the, the decision of how to increase our prices, we also took into consideration what the other area districts are doing with their paid lunch equity. Okay. So with those considerations, we recommend increasing lunch price at elementary five cents to bring it to $2.65. And we recommend increasing uh, secondary lunch price 15 cents, bringing it to $3. Now why we chose that particular lunch increase were two primary reasons. First, that recommendation maintains elementary lunch price parity with the other districts, which is the second, uh, second column from the left. The other is that that, or excuse me, secondary price is also even with what Richland School District is projecting for next year. Now the second reason we picked this split is that that combination brings our paid lunch equity to $2.77. And that's still allowed under USDA regulations. That one cent that we would be under their minimum, we can carry that over into next year's paid lunch equity. 
Okay. So again, this is just an isolation of uh, PASCO's proposed prices. Um, we recommend maintaining current breakfast prices. Breakfast is not part of the paid lunch equity, so the decision to raise breakfast prices is exclusively a local decision. Um, we are a revenue neutral department and we anticipate finishing the school year with, uh, with being revenue neutral, so we don't, uh, we're not relying on breakfast for additional revenue. And then again, at lunch, we are recommending $2.65 for elementary and $3 at secondary. Okay. So then before continuing to community eligibility, I thought this would be a good time to answer any questions that you have about our paid lunch equity. Can you hold me back up, Mark? Do the, uh, you, you have the total paid lunches for elementary and secondary. Do those numbers include, so we were piloting the, the CEP this year. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a certain number of kids that would normally pay, but they're not paying. They're being, they're paying, being paid through that grant, I believe. So does that go into the percentage of elementary school lunches or is that? Considered? No, it, it is only our paid lunches. Any other questions about paid lunch equity? Okay. So, all right. So moving on to community eligibility provision. So as we reviewed in February, community eligibility provision, or CEP, is a USDA program designed to allow schools with high percentages of free and reduced populations to serve school meals to all students without collecting school meal applications. After piloting CEP at Emerson and Stevens, we're looking at the feasibility of adding schools to CEP for next school year. Introducing CEP slowly with our two pilot schools uh, allowed for room for us to tweak our processes and um, mitigate any of the challenges had we encountered anything that was not what we were expecting. But the feedback has been extremely positive from the uh, CEP pilot uh, principals and I'll take the opportunity to thank Charlotte. It's, um, she was very patient working through uh, for a variety of things, so thank you. Okay, so to review the CEP criteria, the first step is to identify the CEP eligibility is by the identified students as of April 1st. And identified students are any, of, any student that receives some type of food benefit, be it um, temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, SNAP benefits, uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program, or any students that are um, considered homeless, migrant, foster, or runaway. Now the minimum qualification to participate for a school to participate in CEP is to have the, those identified student percentage of at least 40%. That's the minimum qualification. With a traditional school, our reimbursement is based on every meal that is served per each category, free, reduced, and full pay. So that's a mix of federal, state, and local funds. With a CEP school, it's strictly federal funds, and instead of each category, um, we're paid on a strict percentage. And that is determined by how high the identified student percentage is. To receive full federal reimbursement, the identified student percentage has to be 62.5 or above. Okay. Now, in addition to the federal criteria, we also considered what our local priorities are in the decision whether to add CEP schools. Our first priority as a department, as a district, is the same priority we have every day, is to serve nutritious uh, meals to our students, which we do. Another priority is that any student that qualifies for meal benefits receive those, which again, we do. 
But another priority in our decision process is to remain fiscally responsible. And nutrition services departments are designed to be independent from their districts. From our reimbursement, we are expected to cover all expenditures, expenditures including indirect expenditures. Now, in Washington, less than 8% of nutrition services departments are revenue neutral, meaning um, of those 92%, uh, money has to come out of the general fund to cover a portion of their expenses. Now, PASCO, we have been historically revenue neutral, and it's a priority to remain that way. So with the revenue neutral priority, we considered schools that would receive 100% reimbursement, which is back to the 62.5 identified student percentage. So with all those considerations, we recommend adding CEP uh, at the following schools. We recommend the elementary schools Captain Gray, Chess, Curie, Frost, Longfellow, Robinson, and Whittier. We also recommend Ochoa Middle School and New Horizons High School. So as you know, all of those schools have an identified student percentage of greater than 62.5, meaning they would receive maximum or for full federal reimbursement. Except for Frost? I'm, that is actually that's my error. That's a old. Um, that's incorrect. They are 62.87 or something like that. But yes, they they did breach that threshold. Apologize. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the next three columns. Those are there to just to illustrate the process we go through to determine meal eligibility for students, um, processing free and reduced applications and direct certification. When in reality, the vast majority of the students at those schools receive um, free or reduced uh, meal benefits. And then the last two columns are our current participation at these two schools, both for breakfast and lunch. We've met with the principals of these schools, and they are very supportive and hopeful that they will be CEP schools for next year. So having heard and seen our recommendation, I'm happy to, to answer questions that you have. How, how many schools are there between the 40, 40% and the full 62.5% reimbursement threshold. And do you know how much it would cost the district to provide to those additional schools? Uh, if you there don't have an answer, you could just send it to us later, maybe. Sure, I can give you a, a brief um, answer. The okay. Chiawana and Pasco High were both, uh, uh, Pasco High was approximately 42, Chiawana was barely 40, but it was 40. I don't have an answer of what it would cost to to do that. And just to review, so the situation with, if it, let's say they have an um, identified student percentage like Chiawana of 40%, USDA applies a multiplier to that amount, and I believe it's 64%. So what that means is we would receive full reimbursement for 64% of those meals, and then the other 36%, I think, <laughs> we would only receive the paid reimbursement, which is 31 cents. So it's a difference between receiving $3.09 and 31 cents. So it's, it's, a, <coughs> it's a huge gap. Um, now the other interesting wrinkle is that in the legislation right now, with the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act, they are looking at increasing the increasing the minimum C, uh, minimum identified student percentage. So that is not set yet. It's currently still 40 percent, but there is legislation to I believe it's high as 60 percent. But this is all of our, we, we don't have any other elementary schools between 40 and 60, is that? We do not, no. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
That leads directly to my question. What happens, if, how hard is it going to be to go back to a normal, what we've been doing before, once we get these kids in this and everyone has free lunches and then the federal you know, government pulls the funding and then we have to go back. Is that going to be really difficult on families or on you in your capacity? Mm -hmm. Well, what we are proposing, that is set. They are not looking at adjusting um, the 62.5%. So that one is, is stable. I would be a little more nervous if we were considering those that were in the 40s or a low identified student percentage. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Oh, you've told us before what's the it's guaranteed for the next year how, how long is it guaranteed for it's a four-year cycle so when when you apply and OSPI um, confirms your numbers you are locked into a four-year cycle they can change the multiplier um, but not those that are locked into a four-year cycle so if they were to change the multiplier next year if in fact these were all to go to CEP, they would be locked in. So do we have to apply and get accepted or is it you apply, you're automatically in? Um, paperwork on our part, OSPI confirms the numbers that we give them, but it's, it's a, f previously we were um, off by one application, so it was negligible. But 100% of, if our numbers are right, 100% of people that apply get it. Meaning if... Oh, I'm sorry. We're guaranteed to get it if our numbers are right there. Yes, yes. All these schools will have it next year. It's not like they're going to choose the top half of them and... No, that I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, that is automatic. Once okay. they accept you, you are good. And then, just to be clear, once you're accepted, everybody gets free lunch, regardless of whether they're free or paid or or reduced. Correct. the The school, the meals are at no cost to the students. So, how do they collect that information that they that they qualified? Is the is that I mean, there's no form sent to the family, correct? Is that? Well, it's a different form. Instead of completing a fairly complicated free and reduced form, the families are asked to complete a family income survey. And that is a much more simplified process, um, both to complete and for the district to process. So, so they, they're, they're, excuse me, there is the, um, that is used to determine um, poverty status for other programs, but for nutrition services, it's it's set. But yes, it is um, to determine um, status for LAP, um, I believe some other state programs. So every year they have to fill out this <laughs> form, is that correct? Correct. And then they also have to fill out another form now currently, I believe, is that? Um, I'm not aware of a second form. I believe it's just the family income survey. Uh, not, right. not you know about this, right, Randy? Are, are you able to say something to this? You, you streamlined your paperwork process. Well, with the uh, when I when I the family income survey survey is the only survey that paperwork that a family has to fill out. They no longer have to fill out the free and reduced application anymore for lunch. But for the district to qualify or for our schools to qualify as poverty schools, do we not have to get additional paperwork as well? I think this was a discussion we had last year when we talked about doing this where previously they, they had to fill out this free and reduced lunch form, which we use that data also to verify that our schools were indeed poverty schools. Am I, am I incorrect in that? No, that's correct, and the Family Income Survey takes the place of that now. Even for the poverty schools? Yes. Because it was my understanding that we had to fill out both of those forms still, even though we qualify for CEP, we still had to get the Family Income Survey, and there was some concern there about that not coming back. So I think those were the details that were the driver for having a pilot this this year with Stevens and Emerson is to make sure that we had the right paperwork 
processes in place and that it was streamlined for our families. So indeed, our families fill out one form. They and that and we didn't we didn't it did not impact our ability to qualify for programs <coughs> so we were able to suss out those details through the pilot program i think it was a question that the, they wouldn't wouldn't want to fill they didn't have to fill it out so that they wouldn't i think that was our question last year or when with the first year and both emerson and stevens had a near 100 percent return rate so it, it was not an issue Okay, so I'm not, so we're, we'll, we'll discuss this in the next presentation, because <laughs> I'm not sure I'm being clear. Yeah, yeah, come on. I think you're clear. Yeah, I think Ms. Winnie said that, that, it's, that it is, they don't have to fill a separate form. But I, my question is along the same lines that I thought that you have an ongoing requirement to turn in a certain number of forms, like above 90%. Is that correct? It's a four-year cycle, but every year at least 90% have to fill out a form, or is that just the first year? It's every year. Okay. And if, what happens if you don't reach that 90%? It sounds like it wasn't an issue at these two schools, but for some reason there's a revolt and you only get 80, you lose the... There is the potential to lose funding in several um, state programs. Uh, it, the timeline isn't as stringent as free and reduced forms. Free and reduced forms, um, the family is not will not receive benefits until um, we process their form. The family income survey is not tied to that. So there is... Uh, there can be a push to gather more forms if they did not come back with the, um, at the pilot schools, for instance, they included it in their registration packet. So it was um, a fairly streamlined system to gather the forms um, from the families. But I think that was a question in the pi when we did the pilots, that if they weren't required to fill out the forms uh, for free and reduced lunches, that we would have a problem getting the forms filled out. Yes. They weren't required to do it, so they wouldn't right. do it, and then we wouldn't keep and our... I, so what I'm hearing is, and it runs in my mind, and I could be way off base here, that the form, the free and reduced lunch form is blue. Is that... It, maybe well, it's, maybe it could be any color, but... <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought we had to get both of those forms, and that was the concern. And I, I, I don't think we're the only district that has that concern, because I think Yakima has a legislative proposal that says, look, we want OSPI to use the CEP information instead of having to collect these forms. But mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say is that's not the case. <clears throat> because the principals were so on top of it and knew that that was a consequence that other schools ran into, that's why they pushed so hard to get So you get are those. still collecting your free and reduced lunch forms? No. It is fam CEP would be family income survey only. We're actually For not... CEP. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Or to qualify as... Mm -hmm. a whatever the programs are for poverty school, mm -hmm. you still have to collect the free and reduced lunch forms. You're telling me you don't. CEP does fulfill that requirement. Yes. At, at a non-CEP school, they still have to collect free and reduced lunch forms. Right. So that's Yakima's thing is so that we're not collecting these forms at this school and these forms at this school. Okay. Make it all one form. <clears throat> Whether you're so, participating. So you're saying that all schools submit the CEP form? No. That's no. Yakima's concern. They want it to be... Is that what Scott's saying, right? You want, they want the non-CEP schools to also just have the same form. Is that right? They want, they want one form for the right. whole district. We're collecting, we're collecting one form per school, but there's two different forms, and each school collects one of the forms. Okay. All right. And interesting about Yakima, because you mentioned that, yes, they did run into trouble the first year that it was uh, a program. They didn't realize that they had to collect the family income surveys and that it would lead, it could potentially lead to a decrease in funding. Now, they did receive their funding eventually, um, but every district, no, every school site that was CEP the last two years has remained a CEP school. So no district has dropped a school. Um, there has been additions, but no, nobody has dropped schools, including Yakima. So they refined their process, I'm going to uh, presume. It, it, 
So how do you know which form to send out? The CEP schools, they include the form in their registration packet, so it's specific to their school. Right. And then the non-CEP schools, we also um, we send out free and reduced applications to those families. These are non-CEP schools that you have listed with the exception of Emerson and Stevens? Currently, yes. <laughs> Is that information based on the free and reduced lunch form? Uh, the stats at the top. The ISP column there, April 1st ISP, you've got... Yes, it's a, it's a combination of a DSHS um, download and our, our internal statistics, yes. So next year, assuming they qualify, you'll just send out one form, which will be the CEP form. Correct, the Family at, Income at Survey. these schools. Yes, if they're approved, that's what we will do. Right, but that's, yeah, you're not collecting those forms. It's the family income survey form versus the free and reduced lunch form. Correct. But this information is not based on the family income survey because you've not sent one out to these schools yet because they're not CEP schools. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Blair. Right. Move on to our next uh, report. Appreciate all the work you did on that, and uh, we look forward to taking action on it at the next board meeting. Thank you. So each year, the Washington State School Directors Association seeks legislative proposals from school boards of directors across the state. The Pasco School Board typically discusses and ultimately votes on issues to submit. So Mr. Christensen will lead the discussion of our um, of the issues that are important to the Pasco Board. Um, he'll take input and develop proposals to be presented for action at the next board meeting. Thank you, Ms. Whitney, fellow school board members. So we're going to talk tonight about legislative proposals. Um, just give you a little background on them. What this is, is this is our opportunity to submit proposals for WASDA to take to the legislative session next year and, and try and get action on uh, these proposals. Now, these would be new proposals, typically. We'll talk a little bit about what WASDA has for legislative positions now, but this is our opportunity to give our input. Now, it's not a requirement. We don't have to. This is just an opportunity. If there's something legislatively that we would like to see happen in our state that would be for the benefit of schools, and this needs to be something not that doesn't just benefit our district, but, but would need to benefit all of the districts in the state, or at least a majority of them. So what happens here is each district has an opportunity to submit proposals to, uh, that, that would ultimately advance to, the, to be a WASDA legislative position. These proposals are due next month, so we have another board meeting where we can approve these. And these proposals from there get taken to the WASDA Legislative Committee where they will be reviewed by the committee. The committee will give them a screening and either make a recommendation that they be passed on to the assembly or that they not be passed on to the assembly. Uh, occasionally they'll get combined in with, with one that's similar. There are legislative positions already that WASDA has, quite a number of them. And if it's similar in nature, they may get combined in or, or they will send a notice back saying, uh, does the wording in this position work for you and, as opposed to modifying it? So the committee meets in June and July. They'll make their initial recommendation of either pass or do not pass. And then it goes to the Legislative Assembly, which is in September. And of course, we as a district have the opportunity to attend that Legislative Assembly to hear all of the proposals that have been that have been made or at least passed on by the legislative committee and to vote either yay or nay that they be legislative positions. What, the, what these positions do, so we've got a, a government relations lady, uh, Marie Sullivan, who is, represents us in, in Olympia and gives us information on what's going on over there. 
as a district or as a board, we put together a list of 10 positions that are important to us so that when legislation comes up over there that might affect us, and it's related to one of these positions, then she can look at that and say, okay, this is what the Pasco School District wants, and this is what WASDA has for all of the districts that they represent, which are all the districts in the state. So that their government relations person can say, okay, here's, here's the WASDA position on this legislation. So in order to become a uh, position, then it has to pass the vote at the legislative assembly. <laughs> It can be submitted uh, as often as you want. If you get it, if you submit it this year, it, uh, it, it will drop off or could potentially drop off next year, so you'd need to submit it again. If it passes three legislative assemblies, then it becomes a standing legislative position, which uh, there are a number of standing legislative positions in the WASDA positions list. That's the one that I sent to the board members and it's available on the WASDA website. I think there are close to 100 positions. I don't know if they're all listed on there. You'll notice the third bullet here talks about legislative priorities. As part of this assembly, we, each district gets an opportunity to rank their top 10 uh, positions from this list. And then those top 10 positions are the, the collection of all the priorities set by each district then gets tallied and that sets our top positions for the upcoming legislative session. So that's what these positions do for us. Um, the legislative assembly this year is September 23rd and 24th. It is in Spokane, so it's a little closer than going over to to the uh, west side of the state, and you're all welcome to go and encouraged to go. I will be there. And it's, it's for those of you who like legislative things, it uh, can be quite interesting. So, this is our chance to submit any positions that we might, that we think might be of benefit to our district and to school districts around the state. This is the one that we were just talking about having to do with the CEP forms versus the free and reduced lunch forms. This is the one that Yakima is submitting and they've invited us to be a second on this. I think this is already a le it's not it's on the legislative position list it's not a standing legislative position yet because it hasn't been there for three years uh, certainly this is one that we can get on board with i think we've submitted one last year about increased funding for not just uh, teachers but all school positions um, I know we've submitted some one, I think, the year before on putting together a database for coaches and to be able to track coaches who have issues that need to be tracked. So this is, uh, now, I think of our 10 standing, uh, of our 10 district positions, which I think you guys have on your screen there on the next page or two. I think all of those are similar to existing legislative positions in WASDA, so I don't know that we necessarily need to submit any of those, but, but there's some, I think one, uh, just a thought that came to me as we were having our discussion on bonds, we're limited in what we can ask our, our community as far as what they might support as a bond. I think that might be an interesting legislative position to submit is, is the ability to do some kind of informal, at least, even formal polling of our community of how much of what they might submit. Our hands are pretty are pretty tight and we're pretty limited on how we can get feedback. So, I mean, I don't know how we would word that, but it might be an interesting one to submit and, and I think it would certainly benefit all the school districts in the state as opposed to having to run a bond to see if the community will support it before you get too far down the road and have to wait a couple more years to run another bond. So. Do any of you guys, have anybody, has anybody given any thought to what uh, something legislatively? We don't need input tonight necessarily. Uh, I can't think of anything that's not on the list that would be 
of great uh, importance to us. But this I, is I do have a question on this one, Mr. Christensen. Yes. Um, I heard I heard us say that the family income survey was pretty easy. We just put it into a packet. But this, this thing that we talked to Yakima about right here, um, like we said, it would get rid of that family income survey for us. Um, OSPI would just use the SNAP and TANF for, for our programs, Mr. Nunnemaker. So I'm just curious how much, I heard it wasn't much effort. Was it much effort to get those, get those forms back, Ms. Stingley or Mr. Nunnemaker? Uh, is this worth us? Hopping on with uh, Yakima and just to reduce the amount of paperwork that you have to collect and sort. Anytime you can reduce pay paperwork is probably a good thing. I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked into it real close though, so I'd, I'd want to take a closer look at it first. So I think what, again, if I understand this, yep. there's two forms, and depending on what your school is, you submit one form or the other, and what we're doing with this proposal is simply eliminating the free and reduced lunch form and going with a single form that all the schools would fill out the same form, which would be the family income. Uh, no, no, no. We, we'd still need free and reduced lunch at schools that are not CEP. But schools that are CEP, we would eliminate the family income survey. Yeah, that the, the president from Yakima sent that to me. CEP schools. You would not need to collect a family income survey. You would use OSPI's TANF and SNAP and all that for your other programs as well. That's what they're trying to do. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. So you'd still have to. I mean, if you didn't have CEP at a school, you'd still collect free and reduced lunch. Uh, department, yeah, DSHS, and then they just apply. So that's a portion of your free and reduced. Um, and then they just apply a, a multiplier. So we're talking about eliminating forms altogether. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So. Free and reduced also. Okay. No, you. Well, I. I'm not I, sure I what this that. does. Quite honestly. The the so the the lady from Yakima sent me it and and it was basically for what she wrote was the president from Yakima School Board was it was to eliminate the need for additional paperwork for CEP schools. If you have free and reduced federal money at a let's say mark twain where my kids go they're not cep they're still going to have to click free and reduce lunch not for their not for their uh, other programs but for their lunch program itself but this would make all your other supplemental programs that we were worried about losing when we went to cep and didn't gather free and reduce lunch things it would get rid of your family income survey is how i understand it Uh, I'll take your word for that, okay. Mr. Lehrman. We'll get further confirmation afterwards, I guess. I'm okay. That that information magically appears and gets attributed to the right district and the right schools, and uh, it's all good, right? <laughs> well, it's it's not magically appears, right? We well, Miss Blair can tell you how she got it, but it comes from BSHS and migrant foster runaway numbers. It says homeless, SNAP, TANF. Uh, yeah, yeah, all those forms are there, but. Those, are those not part of the family income survey? Okay. No. OSPI would take care of it for us, right? Right. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay. So we have a, a couple of weeks to consider things that might be of benefit to school districts legislatively. If there's, and of course we don't have to submit anything, but if anybody has any ideas, then uh, this is the time to do it because the the uh, deadline is in mid-May. I think it's May 16th. You know, the only thing that I've thought about that's kind of outside of this is, you know, we live in this area where, you know, we have Pasco, Richland, and Kennewick, and we, you know, we can pass the same rate as Richland, a tax rate, and Richland collects twice as much even though they have less people and um, I would love to see something to me that's not equity in education that's inequity in education because if you have more industry then you have more money for your schools and that's not right and so I would like something to be more equitable um, across the board so that 
so that PASCO isn't the highest tax simply because so we can house our students. And I think that is part of the, I think that's one of the things they're looking at adjusting with McCleary. That's next legislative session they have a, they have a deadline to do something with that. And we have local effort assistance now that is part of that program to help give us uh, funds even with a low tax base. And so we do get some, but it's probably not perfectly. You know, it's such a catch-22 though if we can't get this fixed because I am, I would guess that we are having a hard time attracting business because we have the highest tax rate in the Tri-Cities. And so it, it just would be nice if we could have even the things that they have in Richland and the things the teachers have in Richland, they're just able to do more for their schools, more for their teachers, simply because it's so much easier to raise money at such an easier, so much, you know, so much less taxing on our families. And I don't see anything that directly says that, so. I think the challenge with that is, you know, if we compare ourselves to others, uh, Connell, I mean, they're in the same, they say the same thing even about us. And so this really comes down to the fundamental uh, distribu distribution of taxes locally and on a state level, a federal level. What is the, that's the fundamental question. What's the proper distribution or redistribution of taxes that are received at a state and federal level? And that's always going to be the debate. But as far as this one, I think that's the, the fundamental question to me in this one is, uh, yeah, if we can reduce government inefficiency and duplication of programs and forms, and that's what we want. And um, good luck to us in doing that, but I'm happy to support that. And just like Mr. Nunmaker said, anything we can do to reduce that, if we can encourage our government to be more efficient, less duplication of programs, uh, that would be fantastic. So we can go ahead and uh, so next time, if you want to support this one, we can Yakima will submit it, and we can just tell them that we support it, and they'll submit it with our name on it as well. So, and I think I, I'd have to check the list, but I, I believe this is one of our WASDA legislative positions already. Um, just brainstorming, we could probably put something in <clears throat> on funding, continuing to fund the super scap type grants for mandates that require us to have smaller K3 or any kind of class size reduction and I need to fund it yeah I, I suspect and I can check on that I believe there is a position on that already but we can sign up for it yeah okay all right so we as a board will think about it and we'll provide mr. Christensen with uh, additional ideas that we have and before we move on for from reports and discussion is there any uh, community members that would like to say anything about either of our reports tonight thank you mr. Christensen for your work on that Go ahead. Uh, mr. Devers Thank you, Mr. Letterman. The only thing, and members of support, Ms. Whitney, um, the only thing that, uh, as a layperson sitting here, just thinking about what you're talking about, we decry the federal government, but what you, what, what have you just done? You've subjected yourself to more control. So it's just, a, just an interesting thought about how this goes. And you know, we don't like the federal government telling us what to do, but hey. It's free money, but it's not free, you know, and it's not going to be free. And equality is all a great thing, but that's part of the way capitalism works. I'm sorry. And to be rich or to build anything, you know, you have to figure out ways to do that. And sometimes you have to do it with less and sometimes you have to do it with more. So like I say, just an interesting thought to think about you know when you're discussing this kind of stuff we decry well you know you we want local control but you just gave it up you know so just a thought 
appreciate those comments. It's it's something that we deal with every day here, and we look at you know we'd like to say we'd like to fully fund our schools with local dollars, but we're heavily dependent on uh, federal and state money for many of our programs. Again, we'd like to not be, but um, it's a spot we're in. Anyone else, Ms. Lewis? Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as I kind of prepared for this meeting and uh, was waiting to hear the presentation on our legislative priorities is that as much as it's important to bring our voice to bear in these additional groups and these additional programs to help the legislature hear us, I really think that it would behoove us to focus locally first before heading off to the legislature to try to get additional dollars, to try to get additional focus. It seems like there are a lot of people that are already speaking to the legislature, Yakima for instance, on things that are relevant to us. I think that right now we're at a place in Pasco where it would be better for us as a community to focus locally first before we start reaching out and saying, well, what other programs can we access? What other tools can we use that someone else is using? I think that one of the problems we have had recently is that we don't spend enough time right here looking at the problems we have right here and trying to deal with the issues that we're facing right here on an immediate and local level rather than looking externally first. Um, that was just one of the thoughts I had because I understand how important it is for us to try to get our voice heard in the legislature but if we do that at the expense of looking what's happening immediately under our noses the kids in our care are immediately going to suffer and in the long term thank you anyone else I, I wouldn't I would like to speak to that um, you know it's hard to differentiate between one and the other. The state puts all these testing, the, the mass, the, the majority of what, the testing that we get comes from the state and federal levels. So if we don't advocate for less testing at that level, we can do very little about it at, at the level here. So there's some things that, that we have to be active in. And one thing is, Sometimes they mess with our funding and, and they say, oh, now you can only use your funding for this and it allows us not to be able to access it. And so then we can't offer programs that we used to be able to offer or have to find funding, take it from other places and cut other things in order to get it. So it's hard. Um, it is so important, like you said, to find a balance and to focus here. And, and which is why Steve's our representative and. I don't go to all of those legislative things because I have a different role and, and that's his. Um, because we do want to focus here first and what we do at the state level hopefully um, helps us locally do what, what we're supposed to better. So that's kind of how I see it. I agree. I, I wish we could focus locally and do what we thought was best for our community, but in a lot of ways we are restricted in what we can do. And I think uh, Ms. Phillips is absolutely right. I mean, we don't go over there to try and necessarily get something. We're going over there to try and find out what they're doing to us and prevent that from happening. And so that's, that's a big part of this. Um, and WASDA is a statewide organization that, that you know, we can choose not to be involved. Uh, I'm not sure that's the best thing to do because it, but, but uh, if we have a voice and we do have a voice, we need to make it heard. But I, I, I agree, we need to focus here. And, and I think we could do some incredible things if we did that. But uh, unfortunately, we're, we're uh, tied pretty closely to what comes out of Olympia, so. Thank you. Next we have action items and we have Ms. Whitney to present the curriculum adoption recommendations.
Good evening, Board President Lehrman, members of the board. At our last study session and board meeting, district staff and members of our curriculum committees presented recommendations for K-12 ELA, or excuse me, English language arts and mathematics instructional materials adoption. And I would once again like those people who participated in that adoption process that are in the room tonight to stand up and be recognized. Please. <laughs> Jennifer Collins. <laughs> I'm here tonight to bring their recommendation full circle and to ask for board approval. English language arts and mathematic curriculum committees have been working hard since early fall, engaged in a multi-layered and thorough review process. Curriculum committee members invested more than 3,000 hours as a collective to assure that the instructional materials that were selected best meet the, the unique needs of our PASCO students and the rigors of the expectations of our Washington State Learning Standards. As required by board policy 2021, the curriculum committees presented their recommendations to the Instructional Materials Committee who are unanimously recommending the board approve Math Expressions K-6 and Agile Minds K-12 for Mathematics. And Journeys Senderos uh, K-6 Collections 711 for English Language Arts. The estimated cost um, for our the budget will be $5.6 million. The district has prioritized funds to make this expenditure. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, you have a motion in front of you. It looks like we went through that really fast. <laughs> We've had all kinds of education on this, and so I want everyone to know that we're not making snap decisions here. Uh, yeah, as, thanks to everybody who worked on it. We said this um, several times at our at our last board meeting, but we did have, as Ms. Phillips said, we had a extensive study session last time where we actually got to talk to the teachers and, and the community members, and they presented to us the, that worked on this uh, on this team. And then we also had another presentation by district staff at a regularly scheduled board meeting uh, two weeks ago. So. Um, uh, there, it, it's open for additional discussion, but if not, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve the math and English language arts curriculum adoption as presented. I'll second it. There's a motion and a second to approve the math and English language arts curriculum adoption as presented. Ms. Smith, can we get a roll call? Mr. Christensen? Yes. <laughs> yes. Ms. Lanigan? Yes. Mr. Lerman? Yes. Mrs. Phillips? Yes. Motion carries. Yay. It's exciting. Again, thank you everyone that was involved in all of this. I know that you spent a lot of hours and a lot of hard work and we really appreciate everything that you did. It's greatly appreciated. All right, finally we have the consent agenda. On, on the consent agenda we have personnel warrant approval, approval of educational specifications for Pasco High Phase 3, approval of Portables 2016 site work, McLaughlin Middle School skylight replacement, out-of-state overnight student travel for Pasco High School Future Farmers of America to the State Leadership Convention in Pullman, Washington, and University of Idaho tour in Moscow, Idaho, out-of-state overnight student travel for Chiawana High School FFA to the State Leadership Convention in Pullman, Washington, and University of Idaho tour in Moscow, Idaho, overnight student travel for New Horizons High School FFA to the State Leadership Convention in Pullman, Washington, Overnight student travel for the Chihuahua High School Jazz Bands to attend a performance at Dimitri's Jazz Alley in Seattle, Washington and participation in the Bellevue Jazz Festival in Bellevue, Washington. Overnight student travel for Pasco High School Mariachi students to the Northwest Folk Life Festival in Seattle, Washington. I entertain a motion. I move to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. Second it. There's a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. 
Uh, Ms. Smith, can we get a roll call? Yes. 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 Mr. Yes. Yes. Next, we have future agenda items. So there's a will be a slight change to the um, study session on May 10th. We will be bringing back some information regarding bond planning. Um, during the board meeting, we will be um, having reports and discussions regarding a curriculum renewal cycle and also a transportation update. We are requesting an executive session this evening under 4231101. 1B for real estate. We're expecting it'll take about 20 minutes and we're not going to be asking for any action. Randy Nunnemaker and Deputy Superintendent Cloud will be joining us. Thank you for attending. We're, we're really excited about the curriculum adoption and we will recess into executive session.